Hello and welcome to So Much For Pathos, the show that kicks bad movies' throats open and forces them to inhale a drain pipe full of bees. I'll be your detective here this evening. So, let's talk about Christopher Nolan. Christopher Nolan is quite possibly one of cinema's current most popular filmmakers. An auteur with a laundry list of standouts in his back catalogue, complete with a signature style and sensibility that many directors have attempted to emulate with varying degrees of success. His back catalogue is filled with many well-respected gems and he's brought joy to millions of 18 to 25 year olds worldwide. A bit like your mum then. Regardless of what you may think of the man, you can't deny that he has tremendous pull as a director with passion projects such as Inception and the forthcoming Interstellar only being greenlit by a major studio because of the mega success that was his Batman trilogy. And speaking of Batman, many film fans and critics alike are said to consider his interpretation of Batman as one of the best there's ever been. But that's not an opinion everyone exclusively shares, seeing as many people have similar feelings to the Kevin Conroy version of Batman from the animated series. But anyway, Nolan's films, and indeed his filmmaking aesthetic, seem to be Hollywood's primary influence these days, short of American superhero comics, with most of the major studios making a bold shift in favour of quote-unquote gritty realism as a direct result of his star power as an artist. With Interstellar hitting a November release date, I feel it's time to look back on what Christopher Nolan has given us over the years, and perhaps get to the heart of why his particular style and sensibility is what drives most of Hollywood's output. So yeah, you heard me right. Today you join me on the cusp of an eight-part investigation into the life and work of Christopher Nolan, and we start with following. As always, let's go over the case notes. Born on July 30th, 1970, Christopher Nolan began making films at a very young age on Super 8 and 8mm, starting what would be a very active interest in cinema. Educated at Halebury and Imperial Service College, he later attended University College London to study English literature whilst making significant use of their filmmaking facilities. During his tenure, he made several short films, very few of which are actually publicly available but are said to be fairly well received. After time at university, Nolan gained work as a filmmaker by directing company videos and had also made Doodlebug, a strange and paranoid short film borrowing influence from Alfred Hitchcock and Franz Kafka showing signs of future promise. During this time Christopher Nolan was not successful in getting projects off the ground as funding from the British film industry was very tight at the time so he eventually decided to pull all his resources together along with the resources of his girlfriend and future producing partner Emma Thomas and Doodlebug star Jeremy Theobald to make his debut feature film. Heavy preparation was required as the production would have to accompany an incredibly tight budget at an estimated £6,000 putting following in the history books as one of the least expensive films ever made. Just to be clear £6,000 is roughly $10,000 and and for the sake of comparison, Clerks was shot for $27,000. Shot on black and white 60mm film, following would see its first screening at the 1998 Toronto Film Festival on September 12th, where it was generally well received, thus beginning Christopher Nolan's professional filmmaking career. So without any further ado, let's look at the film. First, let's establish the way that this story is being told. As with most of Christopher Nolan's output, following is told through a split time frame whilst using the main character's confessions in a police interrogation room as a framing device. So, to follow the movie in chronological order, the movie begins with our protagonist who goes largely nameless but is credited with the moniker Young Man. His interrogation is used as voiceover, so narrating the events of the story, he tells us that he is a writer and one day began to follow people. I'd been on my own for a while and getting kind of lonely. Um, bored. Nothing to do all day. And that's when I started shadowing. Shadowing? Shadowing, following. I started to follow people. He recounts to the policeman how his voyeuristic habit becomes almost an addiction, so he makes up rules in an attempt to keep it under control, don't follow the same people twice and so on, but ends up continually breaking them. One day, a man with a bag whom he's been following confronts him in a cafe. They get talking, surprisingly, and the man, apparently named Cobb, reveals that he is a burglar of sorts, and the bag is full of CDs from someone's house. The young man ends up accompanying him on a job, and as they rifle through a yuppie flat, Cobb describes his methods and motivations. He's a kind of philosophical burglar. He visits homes without invitation or the knowledge of the inhabitants, thus breaking down the convention of respecting other space and privacy and seeing them through their possessions and domestic paraphernalia as they truly are. By taking people's possessions he forces people to think about what they had before he showed up and he gets to steal their CDs and credit cards. Hmm, it's almost as if whoever wrote this had just finished studying English literature. Oh, hang on. Looked at in this way, Cobb's stealing closely mirrors young man's shadowing of people. Both involve a kind of violation, learning about the lives of strangers without their knowledge and against their will. But while the young man's antisocial behaviour springs from his apparent isolation and loneliness as a character, Cobb just seems like he enjoys fucking with people. He plants knickers in a married man's belongings, hides one pair of a woman's earrings, and back at his squat he shakes a can of coke the young man is about to drink. He enjoys making sure people know that he's looked through their most private keepsakes, whereas the young man, basically an intellectual stalker, dreads discovery. Cobb very much enjoys knocking people off balance. 
Vincent. His approach seems to appeal to the young man and he gets drawn into the lifestyle and persona of his new mentor, buying a suit and changing his hair to adopt a city professional type appearance not unlike Cobb's. Cobb even gives him a stolen credit card to pay for a wine bar lifestyle. You're developing a taste for it. The violating, the wireism, oh, it's definitely you. I think not. I think so. At one of these wine bars, young man approaches, contrary to his own rules, a woman who he's previously followed, specifically one later burgled with Cobb and whose earring Cobb stole as a memento. <laughs> Nolan puns. The two begin a relationship, although she is the ex of the bar owner, who she tells the young man is some kind of gangster, and whom she apparently saw murder a debitor with a hammer. Later, the young man, still stalking the woman to some degree in spite of now being able to interact with her in a normal fashion, confronts her about the fact that she is still in contact with her ex, the bar owner, whom he refers to as the bald guy. She confides in him that he is blackmailing her with compromising photos she keeps in the bar safe, although due to the order in which the scenes appear, we already know that she has another agenda. The young man agrees to break into the bar and retrieve the photos. He then informs Cobb of his plans. Cobb responds violently to the news that the young man has become sexually involved with a woman that they've burgled and beats the young man up. The young man nevertheless decides to break into the bar alone and rings Cobb for advice, deciding to bring a hammer and to use Cobb's trademark surgical gloves. However, Cobb's motives are not what they appear to the young man. We, the audience, have seen that Cobb is actually involved with the woman and that they're manipulating the young man. Cobb claims that he is wrongfully suspected of murdering an old woman whose body he stumbled across during a break-in, and the woman is helping him to turn the young man into a patsy. The idea is they fall an impressionable loner, the young man into dressing like Cobb and using his MO, and then put him into a situation, say, breaking into the bar for those photos where he'll be caught. The police have two similarly dressed burglars of similar methods, so reasonable doubt is thrown on Cobb's case. The young man breaks into the bar, opening the old guy's safe using a combination the woman gave him, and finds loads of cash. Having copied Cobb's methods to the extent of not bringing his own bag, he has to improvise, taping the cash to his body, which just shows us how out of his depth he is. He's then interrupted by a security guy whom he manages to knock down with a hammer. Unsure whether the man is dead or alive, he flees with the money and the phone photos which are sealed in an envelope. However, being a nosy Parker by nature, he looks at the photos which turn out to be wholly innocuous. Realising he's been played somehow, he goes to confront the woman who confesses her part in the affair but shows no remorse. Guilty over the security man he clubbed down, the young man resolves to go to the police and tell them everything. You can't. I'm going and I'm going to tell them everything. You can't because they won't believe you. When I tell them everything, they'll believe me because it's the truth. <laughs> Fuck me, that's an impressively doomed sounding line if ever I heard one. So the young man goes off to have the police interview that we started the film with. Later, Cobb visits the woman's house and they celebrate. However, little does the woman suspect that it's actually time for twist number two. Cobb reveals that he's actually a hitman working for the bald guy. He wants him to kill the woman who's been blackmailing him after witnessing the hammer murder at their flat. He attacks the woman with the young man's hammer, which he left behind at the flat during their confrontation. And then we see the conclusion of the young man's interview. The policeman informs him that they've not ever heard of Cobb, nor was there actually an old lady's murder being investigated as Cobb had told the woman there was. They have, however, found the body of the woman. Her fingers were broken with the young man's hammer, making it seem like he had tortured her to gain the safe combination. The hammer also has the security man's blood on it. Cobb has set the young man up doubly. A search of the young man's flat revealed items he kept of the woman, including underwear, making him seem like a perverted stalker, which, to be fair, he kind of is, and one of her earrings. They found no car but the address the young man gave them and believe him a fiction. Cobb's house, in fact, belongs to a man who had just returned from holiday to find his house burgled and credit cards stolen. The same credit card from Cobb that the young man has been using and has signed. We leave the young man impotently protesting his innocence at the station for one final shot of Cobb, if that is his real name, vanishing back into the crowd. Okay, first things first, in regards to this movie's visual aesthetic and presentation, I need to explain what French New Wave is. Chances are you probably already know what this is if you know anything about the history of cinema and or took film studies at college or university. But here on So Much For Pathos, we like to take a no man left behind policy in regards to our reference points as not to alienate any viewers. So I apologise in advance if I'm explaining anything to you that you already know and I wish not to patronise. Anyway, new wave then. It was an artistic movement that existed in its highest prominence between the late 50s and 60s where a group of film critics at the time, Francois Truffaut, Jean-Luc Godard, Claude Chabrol, Jacques Rivité and Eric Romer, all of whom would go on to become tremendous filmmakers in their own right, were working together under the magazine Cahiers du Cinéma. They were challenging established notions of what should be considered high artistic achievement in cinema by re-evaluating the works of the past that had previously been seen as deplorable or even disposable. Genres such as film noir or filmmakers such as Alfred Hitchcock were among many things that they championed. One of the things that the movement is known for is the notion of the auteur theory, which basically hypothesised that in a similar manner to literature, all directors should be seen as the authors of their own work, essentially meaning that a film by an auteur can be seen as a representation of someone's mind and creative soul on display. Which, by the way, that last part you should keep in your mind is it's going to act as the thesis statement for this entire retrospective. With the possible exception of auteur theory, the New Wave movement's most influential innovation was in the area of filmmaking techniques, which is kind of the 
point that I've been laboriously working towards. When the Kayer group decided to turn towards filmmaking themselves, they extended their philosophy from theory to practice, creating some of the most radical, influential and experimental cinema the world had ever seen at the time. Techniques that they innovated include, but are not limited to, the use of long takes, jump cuts, non-linear editing, breaking the fourth wall and films that deal with subject matters such as alienation, loneliness, existentialism and the absurdity of human existence. Using these techniques, they were able to experiment with audience manipulation and their collective role as willing participants in the narrative. Examples of movies that do this would be anything that messes with narrative linearity, has strange and or surreal use of settings, a difficult to understand visual language and the raising of themes and ideas that don't get resolved by the climax. I can imagine that no doubt all of you know of someone who has borrowed inspiration from this movement. Such filmmakers include, but are not limited to, Quentin Tarantino, the Coen brothers, David Fincher, Lars von Trier, Gaspar Noe, Terence Malick and today's subject, Christopher Nolan. The most common technique that Christopher Nolan uses in his films is the non-linear editing style, which he uses not so much to dick around with the audience per se, but to encourage them to keep up. In the case of following, the non-linear editing, as hard it is to keep up with, is surprisingly necessary to the story Nolan is trying to present. As anyone who saw the We Need to Talk About Kevin review that we did, you probably know that non-linear editing is used to create a sense of fracturing from the protagonist's point of view, usually owing to the story being presented from a damaged mindset. Here in following, it's used to a similar effect, except the central character isn't damaged, as he is instead blinded by conspiracy and struggles to put the pieces together. It's rather effective, it immediately places you in the same mindset as the protagonist and encourages you to work as hard as the character is to figure out what's going on. Christopher Nolan has gone on record by saying that the way that the film was edited is intended to invoke a sense of mystery in the characters. He said, and I quote, In a compelling story of this genre, we are continually being asked to rethink our assessment of the relationship between the various characters. And I decided to structure my story in such a way as to emphasise the audience's incomplete understanding of each new scene as it is first presented. And that's the part that works really nicely here. The whole film works really well as a genre deconstruction exercise while still functioning as a standalone good movie. We're all familiar by now with the detective who struggles to figure out the mystery and yard yada you will get it. But here it's a noir that strips the detective element out of the story and focuses more on the characters. Our central character, the young man, is never actually given a name in the film. Okay, well he does, but we're not entirely sure whether this is his actual name. What's your name? Bill. My name's Daniel Lloyd. My friends call me Danny which would imply that he doesn't really have an identity or at least struggles to find one and or define himself. When he meets Cobb, he finds an identity through him, becoming his sidekick. What's interesting though is that the first job they do together, Cobb delivers this suspicious sounding line. Hey, 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 what the, what the hell did you do that for? It's like a diary. They hide it, but actually they want someone to see it. That's what I do. You can see on my display, flip sides of the same coin. This way they know that someone's seen it. That's what it's all about. Interrupting someone's life, making them see all the things that they took for granted. Like when they go back and buy all this stuff from the shelves of the insurance money, they'll have to think for the first time in a long time why they wanted all this stuff, what it's for. You take it away, you show them what they had. Then what proceeds to happen is that the young man... You know, I'm kind of sick of calling him the young man, so from now on we'll call him... Chris. Anyway, what happens to Chris is that he uses Cobb to forge an identity for himself, only for that identity to be stripped from him by the end. So the question I must ask is, when watching the film for a second time, if we know that Cobb is going to fuck him over later on, then what does this say about Chris? Well... I'd offer that he's desperate. The reason why he eventually becomes Cobb's accomplice is because they both have a mutual understanding of each other, and the only reason for robbing the bar is his relationship with the young woman. He's a man struggling to connect in a world where he sinks into the crowd as another nameless, faceless drone. His rules that he consistently breaks when following people, and his relationship with the Cobb and the young woman ultimately give him a purpose, even if that purpose is at first to use them as characters in his story. He's someone who has a deep fascination with other people's lives, but he appears to be this way because of his lack of connection to the very same anonymous people he follows. Chris is both a writer, aka an understander of people and identities, but doesn't have an identity of his own. These two elements existing in one character creates a strange whiplash which is intentional. This is very much an existentialist viewpoint of character creation, which leads us to Christopher Nolan's secondary influence, Franz Kafka. K Kafka? Fr Franz Kafka? Anyone? Anyone? Okay, I guess we're going to need a brief introduction to Franz Kafka. I mean, it's worth getting all this background stuff out of the way before we move on to Nolan's other work, so... Now, this is going to be pretty dry stuff, I will admit, and you've already had to sit through me explaining New Wave. So to break things up, while I'm explaining Kafka's influence on the following screenplay, every now and then I'll interject with a dancing cat. Like this. <laughs> Pretty 
much any time you see a character in this sort of film given what can be described as an existentialist treatment, the writer will owe a massive creative debt to Kafka, who more or less defined how these sorts of philosophical ideas are explored through noir cinema. And let's face it, this film is as noir as you can get without a gangster's mole showing up asking for help and sultry smoking a cigarette, oh no wait, that actually happened. The term Kafka-esque is commonly applied to films such as Brazil, in which the protagonist is helplessly trapped in a labyrinth of either bureaucracy or some other complex imprisoning system. The artificial memories and environments in Dark City, for example. These works all owe a debt to Kafka's incomplete novel The Trial, in which one Joseph K is charged with an unknown crime. Unable to discover the nature of the charge or his accusers, the protagonist stumbles from government agents to court officials to lawyers to fellow defendants in a futile attempt to discover a way out of the trap of a trial in which there can be no acquittal. <laughs> However, one can also see Kafka's influence in films where the protagonist, sometimes as anonymous as Chris is, seem or are eventually revealed to be fundamentally isolated or lost. They may, like Chris, or like the protagonist of Kafka's short story The Stoker, be drawn into the activity or cause of a more forceful character, a cob figure by any other name. They may also, as in his work The Country Doctor, find themselves manipulated by others by circumstance until they find themselves betrayed and humiliated. Sounding familiar? Frequently then, in Kafka's works, the protagonist is weak-willed and easily manipulated. Frequently he proves by the end of the story to be profoundly alone and without true friends. And frequently he finishes the story either by dying a harsh and lonely death, as in both the trial and the judgement, or by finding himself otherwise undone. He followed you and realised you were just this sad little father waiting to be used. The shy and isolated traits of his characters can be seen as reflections of Kafka's own neurotic character and the lack of social and sexual confidence. Okay. Of course, not every exploration of existential ideas in film takes a Kafka-esque approach. There are exceptions. It's probably worth noting what I mean by existentialist here. Existentialist thought covers a lot of different themes, but the most central has to be Sartre's notions of existence versus essence. As Sartre put it, man first of all exists, encounters himself, surges up in the world, and defines himself afterwards. It's not who I am underneath, but what I do defines me. Basically the idea is that your essence, who you are as opposed to what you are, is defined by your choices. It is free will but one must, as an individual, make a decision to have free will, to consciously take control of one's own existence and thereby become more than merely the instrument of others, or flossom on the sea of circumstance. Each individual must, within himself or herself, choose to act decisively out of moral conviction, independently of the influence of their circumstance, upbringing, friends or even their own immediate emotions, and only then can they truly call themselves whole individuals. We all have past problems and good and bad influences, but they only define us if we let them. We have the ability to choose, and this is what makes us people rather than merely sophisticated biological machines. Why, Mr. Anderson, why, why do you persist? Because I choose to. This notion is not even limited to the work of the more cerebral or arty filmmakers. In fact, the most powerful moments in any film can occur when a character has to decide whether to give in to his feelings or do what others want, or whether, even in the face of death, to make his own choice. Never. I'll never turn to the dark side. Looking at Kafka's works as explorations of existential concepts, the quintessential Kafka character is one who fails to establish his own essence, which is to say his own identity, which adds up to more than the sum total of influences he is currently under. A character through the weakness of will or lack of understanding never acts to take control of his own situation, and so remains a pawn of circumstance or of the manipulations of others. And this is clearly what we have in Chris. He really is just waiting to be used, to be given an identity rather than forge one of his own, to internalise someone else's decisions and views rather than making his own life choices. He remains a puppet and, in the end, this dooms him. This is a very Kafka-esque idea. So in the end, Christopher Nolan has crafted a work that aims to question the nature of human identity by marrying it to the very familiar genre tropes of film noir. This is the part that strikes me as the most impressive. It's a surprisingly tight and confident work, which is very rare for a first-time filmmaker. Nolan, in his first outing as a writer-director, demonstrates his capabilities as a filmmaker who not only has a great knowledge of cinema and its history, but also has a great understanding of why New Wave, Hitchcock and Franz Kafka were instrumental to cinema in the first place. Following is ultimately a wholly satisfying and highly impressive work that all Christopher Nolan fans need to see. It's incredibly well crafted from head to toe and does a very good job of expressing a very complicated idea. There are some very minor issues that I have. For instance, a potential criticism can be found in some of Cobb's dialogue, which often sounds like pretentious pablum, but it's necessary because this is precisely the kind of thing that Chris likes to hear and get his pseudo-intellectual side hooked into the conspiracy. Actually, scratch that, because that's more of a positive. Part of the reason the film is non-chronological is that Nolan has deliberately designed it to benefit from multiple viewings. Basically, as I said earlier, Nolan uses non-linear arrangement to confuse the viewer, or at least subtly mislead them about the true meaning of 
of certain scenes. Watching a second time, actions and words that seemed trivial or odd before take on a different significance, now that you know what's really going on between the characters. Thinking about it, considering how intelligently non-linear editing is used in this, his first feature, it's strange that the flashback sequences in Man of Steel seem so awkward and bereft of purpose. Flashbacks are just non-linear light after all, but you know, one film at a time. A more valid problem, however, is that the story is somewhat contrived. The setup relies on a couple of coincidences to occur, such as the fact that Chris, who just so happens to be following the girl who just so happens to be working with Cobb, the man who's following Chris in the first place. But Nolan's ability to work low budget on his first outing with such efficiency is what makes following work so well. It's marvellously well shot and very finely edited. That's one of the things that can make or break an independent production. Working with very limited resources forces you to get very economical with your shots. And Nolan shows himself to be a highly competent filmmaker with an eager young voice, as well as having a respectful and experimental attitude to the cinema he draws from his reference. Taken as a whole, following is a great film and almost certainly warrants a second viewing to fully grasp what Nolan has presented us here. And if I were on the judging panel of the Toronto Film Festival of that year, I'd easily say, yeah, this kid's going places. So that was following. The case has only just begun for Christopher Nolan, so join us next time when we talk about Memento. But for now, I'm Matt Crowley, and that was following. Mm -hmm.